Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vaga Maradian here at the Pentagon at the offices of Hondo Gertz, the Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Research Development and Acquisition, to discuss the MQ-25A Stingray Award uh, yesterday. Hondo, it's always a pleasure seeing you. Thank you, Vago. Uh, congratulations uh, on your Bouncing Baby program, $800 million, Boeing uh, the winner uh, for four aircraft there to deliver them, I think, in 20... IOC in 2024. Uh, IOC in 2024. Uh, two of the other competitors were Lockheed Martin and, and General Atomics. You had to call them yesterday and, and let them down. Um, you met with uh, reporters uh, yesterday along with the Chief of Naval Operations to give a little bit of a briefing on what is, as you've referred and as the CNO has referred to it as a hallmark program, mm -hmm. uh, one of the CNO's three priorities, the Stingray program, the ultra-large diameter underwater vehicle, and the laser effort you, you have ongoing. Talk to us a little bit about why this program is so important for the United States Navy. So, so Vago, I, I see it as a hallmark kind of from three different perspectives. I think as the CNO stated yesterday, it's hallmark because it's the world's first unmanned uh, air vehicle I go aboard for carrier ops. So it'll be integrated into the carrier operations. And, and so operationally, that's a huge, a huge deal for the Navy. Provides great capability for those carriers. And so operationally, it's, it's a pioneering program. Technically, the way we went about it, I think, is also very remarkable. We had a very close interaction between requirements and acquisition, uh, and so that let us very quickly work through the requirements process and then lock down to kind of the two really key performance parameters. And then from an acquisition perspective, uh, we, we highlighted those two performance parameters and then gave the designers a pretty wide open space to go off and design their design. So, Unlike some programs where we over-constrain requirements, here we really wanted to, here's what's really key for the Navy, and then designers bring all your creativity, all your innovation to the forefront. And then finally, we executed a very tight source selection, nine months from RFP to contract award on a major activity. I've got a lot of confidence in that source selection, what the teams did. And so I think all those coming together really lets us speed to the fleet, kind of new capability. And what were those uh, two key performance parameters, right? Because normally you get sheets and sheets and sheets mm -hmm. of stuff. You've been telling us uh, since you entered office why this was going to be a highly um, uh, carefully controlled process. What are the two key performance parameters? So you got to be uh, be able to operate on a carrier. So you got to be carrier real suitable, right? And so that means you got to be able to take off land, interoperate with the man platforms, all the systems. And then you've got to be able to give gas. So, you know, you got to get out there and stretch the uh, the carrier air wing, and so if you can operate on a carrier and you can give the gas we want at the range we want, then that's a design we're interested in. Uh, keeping it simple. So tell us what differentiated the Boeing bid. Uh, the General Atomics guys were confident, the Lockheed guys were confident, the Boeing guys were confident, everybody thought they had the right solution. Why is it that uh, Boeing was the winner ultimately from your standpoint? Yeah, so I, I, I do have to thank all three uh, design teams. They did an extraordinary job. Uh, I think another hallmark of this, uh, this whole competition is the uh, communications we had. So very good dynamic uh, communications with designers up front as we structured the program and then uh, through the competition, they all provided excellent designs for us to, to work our way through. Uh, ultimately, uh, we told uh, each of the designers kind of our criteria. And then when we looked at those criteria and how their designs uh, and proposals stacked up, uh, Boeing was the one that came out uh, on top of that competition. But, but you know, as an acquisition guy, you always wanna have a, uh, a fair, credible uh, and robust competition. And, uh, and this was fair, credible, and robust. Um, you've mentioned, um, that's right, because you termed Boeing as the best value uh, mm -hmm. uh, yesterday. Um, what, you also sort of op left the door open for folks to get back in because you said, look, we may have um, in the growth path, you know, we're starting as a tanker, some ISR capability we may want at some point. So could there be multiple models of the MQ-25? One is the MQ-25A and the other is the MQ-25B? Yeah, I guess where, uh, where I was coming from there was um, one of the other hallmarks of this program is the government's the lead system integrator. And so we are doing the carrier uh, integration. We are doing the, uh, all the command and control links. And so what I was saying from that perspective, that sets the foundation for future platform requirements we may have. Uh, and as those requirements become known, then we can more quickly uh, integrate because we don't have to reinvent how are we going to control them, how are we going to, uh, integrate them onto the carrier, uh, we can just work on those designs. So, you know, what they're called and under what nomenclature will depend in the future. Uh, for right now, we're focused on MQ-25. That sets the foundation, uh, but we're doing it in a way so that we can quickly 
uh, react to future requirements. How does this pave the way for a future strike asset, right? I mean, the debate a few years ago in the Navy was uh, John Greener, uh, former CNO, would talk about sort of 5,000 pounds of payload, either uh, ISR platform or strike at long range. Um, how do you see this paving the way for a future strike capability, a deep strike capability for the Navy? So without getting kind of, uh, you know, guessing what the future beholds, what we're trying to do is set the architectural foundation. And so by having the government running that command and control link, setting the architecture, setting the control integration onto the carrier, then we aren't um, constrained to just the way we've done the original architecture for the MQ-25 under some proprietary data link or whatnot. So in that case, we have got great flexibility uh, as requirements teams understand what their future requirements would be. And then we've piloted this process where we can quickly iterate between acquisition and requirements so that as requirements are identified, we can quickly neck down into the, okay, here's what's achievable in a certain amount of time for a certain amount of money. Uh, and But could this, air, could this airplane at some point become a strike airplane, or would that be just a different airplane in the future? Right now, the focus on MQ-25 is deliver those two, two key performance parameters. Um, and there's, there's certainly, again, we always look for flexibility, but our key performance parameters are what's driving uh, our thinking right now on the aircraft side leaving open the architecture that allow us to go in whatever direction we want. Um, let me take you to the protest-proof nature of this. I mean, sometimes the best laid plans, right, you're looking at a very aggressive schedule, but program protests have a tendency of derailing it. And, you know, as we saw, for example, with a lot of programs, it's, it, it can de delay the process by, by a considerable amount of time. What are some of the specific uh, actions you've taken to make sure that this is protest proof, that the decision you've taken is the decision, once you outbrief it to the, to the, to the uh, losing competitors, at the end of the day, this is going to be sustained and you're going to move ahead on the program? So my commitment was uh, execute that competition the way we said we would. I believe we've executed the competition to the criteria we set up front. Uh, and so, you know, that was my, my commitment. My other commitment is to give robust outbriefs. Uh, so each competitor understands how we made the decision and how their particular design stacked up. I'll never say anything is protest proof because that's always an option. And, uh, and if uh, one of the competitors chooses to go down that path, we'll work our way through that. Uh, but I'm pretty comfortable that we were, uh, you know, we set very clear decision guidelines and we executed to those guidelines. Um, one of the challenges always is, you know, you controlled the process very, very carefully up front, but once you get into development, there's all sorts of stuff that comes up. Folks want a little bit more bell or whistle, um, maybe sometimes unnecessarily, but other times necessarily. Um, you know, how are you thinking this through? What's the architecture, the thinking to ensure that whatever it is you're starting now is going to stay on track and is going to be able to be delivered to that uh, six-year timetable? So, so again, focusing on what's really important. So we've identified those key uh, critical parameters, uh, and so we'll keep focused on those. Secondly, uh, you know, by the way we've set up this program, we're relying on mature technology. We're not inventing technology. Uh, and then third, we've got a great team uh, on the government side. Uh, looking forward to working with Boeing on the contractor side to go deliver the program. And uh, I know you're putting a premium on speed, but there are some thoughtful folks who are saying, hey, you know what, six years, that's great, but that's still way too slow to be as relevant as you say uh, we need to be. Well, how do you respond to them regarding that uh, time span in order to achieve a program like this? Yeah, yeah sure. Six years is a long time, um, but you have to think about what are we trying to achieve here. So, you know, we'll have a uh, first vehicle up flying, uh, we're the first flight within two years. Uh, but there's a lot of work to integrate that onto the carrier uh, to make sure that we're safe, that we can interoperate, uh, and that uh, we can be effective in there. So we've got to not only, so, you know, you can focus on the ear vehicle. That's not a six-year timeline. Uh, there's all the uh, control. There's the alterations to the ships. There's all the integration and certification on the ships. And so when you start putting that all together, six years sounds like a long time. There's a lot of work to go off and do. And so our focus now is... Uh, accelerating through this program, not taking our foot off the accelerator. Uh, the team has done a great job getting to this point. There's a lot of hard work ahead, uh, and that's where we're focused. One last question, because I know I'm going to get the hook otherwise, uh, is um, these are three very ambitious programs. Um, how do these three programs 
come to how, what are going to be the common themes of these disparate programs? One is a very high energy laser, uh, which is important to the to the CNO. The other one's an ultra large underwater vehicle, uh, very very different environment, very different systems. What are the three common approaches you or what is the common approach that you're using among these three, and how do the three play among one another to give you these programs, ambitious as they are, quickly? So we're all about delivering a national defense strategy, right? And that is uh, being in a position to compete and win. And so you've, you've named three programs. I could name multiple others, frigates, uh, lots of other programs. And what you're seeing is really getting interactive between requirements and acquisition. So we understand what we are going to go after, and then we put in high-confidence acquisition programs to go, go deliver on that, each acting with a sense of urgency so we can uh, you know, deliver at the speed of relevance. And so the, the common theme is uh, the whole team working together, synchronized, uh, defining clearly what do we need to be a viable product out there, and then going and delivering with high confidence. And uh, uh, from an empowerment standpoint, uh, is everybody, you know, your, your leading job is, is culture change in many mm -hmm. cases, right? How is that process going? Are the folks, as you go deeper down into the system, as much embracing this kind of an approach? Yeah, I, I, I've been very clear about that. Uh, anywhere I can, we are decentralizing all of our activities. Uh, I have great confidence in the folks down working in the trenches. Uh, as long as we're focused on removing obstacles for them, enabling them, I think you're going to see amazing delivery. We're already seeing amazing things being delivered out of those teams. So my whole career I've learned that um, decentralizing, empowering, and then being an advocate for the folks doing the work, is what this job is all about, and uh, and I'm, I think you'll continue to see us accelerate forward uh, as a Navy. Hondo Gertz, Assistant Secretary of the Navy for uh, Research, Development, and Acquisition. Sir, thanks very, very much. Best of luck, Fairwinds, Following Seas, and have a great holiday weekend. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Fago.